uh, first of all, let me uh, welcome everybody uh, who's here from the uh, Spark 2022 uh, Animation Festival. Uh, this is one of the uh, spotlight um, interviews podcasts with um, uh, notable international independent animators. And uh, today, uh, my name is Michael Fukushima. Uh, formerly an animation filmmaker, then a producer, then a studio head at the National Film Board of Canada, uh, now retired, uh, mostly retired, and uh, doing, uh, trying to do mostly things that have nothing to do with work. Um, which is why I'm here, because this is not work. Uh, so our guest today is um, uh, the uh, the much renowned, um, quite famous uh, for a very early online animation project, uh, educator, uh, animator, filmmaker Christine Panushka. Christine, welcome and thank you for being here. Hi, thank you for having me. It's great. Uh, so I've hinted at something that you've done. We'll talk about that a bit later. Um, I want to talk more about uh, about your films, your uh, your short films, and um, your feature. But I'm uh, uh, rather than have you uh, kind of go through your animation career up to now, I'm just going to do a uh, what I think is a capsule version of it, and then if I've missed anything significant, you can jump in and say, "Hey, hang on a second. <laughs> um, so the capsule version is really short. It's like two lines. Um, you went to CalArts Experimental as a student. Mm -hmm. um, does that mean you were a student of Jules? I was. Oh, my goodness. That's like a dream. Um, then you were several years as associate director of the yeah. experimental well, program. Faculty first and then later associate director. I was there for 13 years teaching. OK. And um, your latest gig, which is like a couple of decades now, uh, a daytime gig, is uh, you've been the you've been a professor at the USC School of Cinematic Arts. Is that what it's yes. called? Yes. Yes. Okay. And uh, I believe you have seven short films uh, under your belt. I think so. And there's a few. They're collaborative projects and some extras hanging out on the sidelines. Okay. It's sort There's of a, floating, yeah. floating around there with your name on it, but you can't quite, yeah, I, I get yeah. it. Can't quite, did I just, did I actually look at it? <laughs> some little <laughs> ones. Um, uh, okay, so that's great. So that's a kind of a, an overview of, of, uh, of Christine Panushka as a creator, as an animation filmmaker. But what I want to talk about first is last year, you released, I think it was last year, you released <laughs> your first animated feature film, Blood of the Family Tree. <laughs> um, so I, I got to look at it. Um, I absolutely love it. I love oh, thank how you. rich. Oh, it, it's, it's, it's so lush. And the and the visuals are so enveloping. Uh, you know, it was it, even though I had to watch it on my computer, I was pulled. I was pulled right into it. Um, and it uses a chaptered storytelling mm -hmm. structure. And so I'd like you to talk a little bit about that. Um, whether it was primarily for storytelling, which of course it does really well but also perhaps for to make production a bit easier for you. Yeah. Uh, so that's the question. And then the second, uh, the second part of the, of the blood of the family tree question is um, just, it feels like an extremely personal film. And then especially there's a, there's a special dedication at the end. So could you talk about you know, is it actually drawn from personal history? So, um, yeah, so let's talk a bit about what is that? Well, I'll start first about the um, structure so and how the film came about. So I was 
it is personal because I was diagnosed with this strange, weird blood disease called polycythemia vera, where your body, your bones just make too much blood. And so I was kind of, and that, this was about quite a while ago. And so I was kind of like, I went to Zagreb and Karen Aqua was there and she had just been diagnosed with cancer. So we were sitting there going, we were sitting, I remember we were sitting on a bench going, ah, and so we kind of made a, a compact that we would, rather than just going, we would turn it into art and make a film. So Karen made the most beautiful, exquisite film called Twist of Fate. And with my film, because it was, at that time they thought it was hereditary, it ended up having all these different kinds of aspects. And I kept trying to force it into a short form and it just didn't work. It just just I couldn't I couldn't do it It was just too complicated and so I I kept developing images and this went on for a number of years I just kept drawing drawing out um, the stuff and then um, I saw Lewis Clark's film 66 um, where he had put together a bunch of his short films I mean it was carefully structured into a long film and I don't know it's just kind of like a moment where I went, oh, maybe that's what I can do, which seemed, because it never occurred to me to ever even make a feature film because I love the short form. I love the poetry of it and the density of the short form. So, so I just decided, okay, that's what I'm going to do. And it started to make sense. And so then I told people I was going to make a feature film by myself so that I would make it. And, and, um, so I wouldn't be embarrassed if I didn't. So I, I said, I'm going to make a feature film and different people like Igor Kovalyev said, you're, you're crazy. Cause I said, I was going to make it all by myself. And in that way it became kind of a research project. If I could figure out how to make um, a non-narrative, you know, a non-narrative uh, cause it's experimental feature animated film that was engaging could keep the audience engaged and do it all by myself. And so I, it just, and then it, once I decided that it went really, really fast, it only took a couple of years to make the film. And, um, and then the only help I had with it was Miroslav Tadic did the music and I've known him for a long time. I went to school with him and he's an amazing, incredible musician, guitar player and composer. And so uh, Miroslav and his partner Yvette did the music and it's exquisite and it was more wonderful than I could ever imagine. And then um, Chris Morocco did the mix. That was the only help I had. So working through that form of chapters was a, a way to um, vary the pacing of the film, surprise the audience. So um, when, so you get through the first three sections and it's like, okay, the audience thinks, oh, okay, now I kind of understand what this is. And then you get to a section that's a rock and roll and driving hard. And it's like, wait, wait, no, that's not what I thought it was. And then later on, it introduces the imagery of knots and lace. And so it goes through like that. And so each section has something unique and introduces something new. And then each section, each motif in the film is woven through the film at least three times. And that ties it together along with the musical themes. And then right. like I no, said, I was what? Say, it, mm-hmm. it certainly, it certainly uh, uh, forces the audience to be paying attention. Um, you know, it is a, it is a, it's a risk with a, a non-narrative experimental long form. Yes. That the, that the audience, you know, once they, once they think they know your rhythm and what it is you're doing, they kind of drift away, but you very deliberately um, forced me to, oh, hang on. Okay. <laughs> Yes, and you know, I think the long, long form, like Jules Engel, Jules always said, if you have a story, you can get away with the art. So if you don't have a story, how do you get away with the art? And then he also said, insisted that um, sort of non-narrative films, like five minutes was pushing it, which I don't agree with, but that was Jules. And so it's like, how do you do that? And it's really hard and there's only about seven or eight non-narrative animated feature films. 
So there's Harry Smith's Heaven and Earth Magic, Larry Jordan's Sophie's Place, um, Lewis Clark 66, Patrick Bokanowski made two, Laange, and then I can't remember the other one. Um, and then Sistiago's amazing film, whose title I cannot pronounce because it's Basque, which is all painted on film. And um, there's one more. Well, and I think there's one more. And then, then after, after I started, Joanna made her beautiful film, North, Blue, North of Blue, I think it's called. Right. Yeah, yeah. And there have been a few others starting to pop up. So, and then the other thing for me is, you know, the, of being able to make it by myself, I could only do that because of digital technology and after effects. And so I came out of it with a deep um, appreciation of after effects and Photoshop. And even though I painted most of the imagery as hand done, then I scanned it in, cut it out and could build complexity through after effects and Photoshop. Well, uh, it's, it's, um, it's interesting you talk about digital tools um, because you've been at this for a long time. So I'm curious, um, did you, did you, have you come to the digital tools recently or were you kind of an early adopter, you know, when Photoshop first came out in the mid nineties, when After Effects, were you dabbling with digital? Um, a little bit. When I came to digital, um, there's an organization in um, Los Angeles called Newtown Pasadena, there was, and they had commissioned six to pair six animation artists and six spoken word artists to work together. So I ended up working with um, um, Beto Arazia, who is a spoken word artist and performer from East LA, who grew up in Compton. And, and I had seen Beto's work. I knew what he was about and really hard, hardcore Compton, Hispanic and gay. And I came, you know, grew up in Salt Lake City as a non-Mormon. So maybe that's sort of in common, but really different. And so it was interesting collaboration to find out where our meeting place was. But I ended up doing, we ended up doing um, a half an hour piece. So it had a half an hour of animation in it. So it, it was with that um, piece, they started, I started using digital tools because I just couldn't, I couldn't get, get it done if I, tried to do it the way I had previously done it because it took me like six years to do marrow because I kept it was all drawn with a videograph pen and going back and I think I do the film five times because I get one of those drawings with like eight characters done and then the pen will go Nyeh, and I'd have to start over again so and so it was kind of a revelation and really amazing and we started before that thinking, looking at digital tools with the absolute site, which we can talk about later. So that's when I started working digitally. And that film was all, um, or that project, which was called Mosca, was all drawn digitally as well. And then after that, I made content of clouds and that was painted and scanned and a lot of stuff scanned in and cut out and, and using found paper and found photographs. And then that, I thought that was going to be part of Blood of the Family Tree, but it didn't fit. It was its own piece. Okay. So I haven't really well, placed that. Um, so this is, this is uh, off my script, but um, uh, I wanted to ask you a little bit about Singing Sticks. I think it's Singing Sticks. Mm -hmm. Is that the one with the rubber stamp, with the stamp? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So I'm assuming they were actual rubber stamp they were not digital rubber stamp but then did they you in, in, did you manipulate them digitally no no that was pre-digital that film okay and and in some ways it was like a lot of things playing with materials can lead to new ways of thinking about things and new imagery so i had founded the program the animation program at the california state summer school for the arts in 87 so that so in the 90s um part of what i had to do what i would do is order art supplies for all the kids so they would come in the high school students and get a bunch of a package like a sketchbook and um 
some pencils and pens and things like that. So they were all kind of, it was an even playing field because the students came from very diverse backgrounds. But one of our projects was, you know, cutting out rubber, you know, people do this, cutting up erasers, cutting out a little stamp and stamping it to make a flip book. But the stamps we got were from, I got from, were really cheap and they were from Spain and they were like butter. They were so nice to carve. And then, so I was playing with them, encouraged me, maybe I could make these into like articulated puppets if I did different stamps. And so that's how um, Singing Sticks came about. It was just playing with the materials and with um, how you move things through the, the frame. And I wanted to make a dance, a film that was dancing, it was about dance and but, death. So then, yeah, right, I'm gonna to get to that as well. Um, but you talked about articulated characters. So heads were separate from torsos, were on a yeah, separate stamp, torsos. So the, the little stamps are only like, only like this big the little rubber stamps there's these little pink erasers so any part of the character couldn't be more than like an inch by an inch okay okay got it and so you unless you glued the erasers together which made lines um that still is still disabled the screen sharing you couldn't have a larger stamp so everything had to be nothing could be bigger than now that i did glue a couple things to get the dresses. And, and so I, and then I stamped it, I got the, this vibrant color, I stamped it on tracing paper and I painted okay. the stamps with um, Tomboy um, pens. And so the tracing, and then when we shot it, it was um, Nick Vasu who would shoot all the independent stuff down in Los Angeles, um, his, stepson Chuck shot it we lit I had it lit from underneath and from an, on top okay so it sort of glows and but the, yeah. there was a digital component to this in that I did all the animation and then well what I did it was a really backwards way to work it was I had my first computer when I first got to USC so I scanned in all the drawings and then I um, started playing with them and so I edited it all kind of in an early um, premiere program I got it so I had it all edit then from the edits I wrote the sheets and then I okay. gave the sheets to Chuck and he shot it and I wow. edited the music so I had so I kind of had the rhythm and the, the film all plotted out and I gave that to Miroslav the same composer who did Blood of the Family Tree and I told him I had three sections and I wanted the last section to have something that sounded like bones. And so you made this great soundtrack. And then I edited it to the sound. I didn't animate it to the sound, but I edited to the, to the music. And then I gave it to Chuck. Right. Well, that's, you know. It, you, it was backwards. You, Writing the sheets was. Well, you say backwards. It's, it's not completely backwards. I mean, you know, conventionally, the, you know, yeah, there's one, you know, you skipped one. So you it's, put, you did the sheets before you did the animation. Well, it's not completely. Backwards. Well, I, I, no, I did the know. sheets after I did the animation. Oh, okay. So, <laughs> sorry, I misunderstood up. that. Okay, then yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, but, you know. That's backwards. Yeah, yeah, okay. But you weren't doing your own film, so you needed to do it that way. Right, right. Yeah, but I needed, but you know, I needed to be able to communicate with the camera person. Of course, yeah, yeah, because oh. it wasn't you. Yes, yes, yes. Like I could not do it. Here's an image of singing sticks. So you can see how um, all the different pieces are made out of different stamps, and then that all the different pieces allows um, you to move them around. Yeah, it, it had it had a very cutout, uh, paper cutout quality to it, because most of it, you know, not most. So I've seen two other uh, rubber stamp films, one of them by my friend Lizzie Hobbs. And, you know, the way Lizzie did it was she she, she had bigger stamps and she carved the entire character. So, yeah. You know, the actual animation drawing was the stamp. Um, yeah. And, you know, there's a, there's a rustic 
quality to that. But I was quite taken by Singing Sticks when I saw that it was stamps because of just how animated it was. And it really had that kind of paper cutout uh, yeah. quality to it. Yeah, and Joanna Priestley made one called the rubber stamp film, but she used it was the same thing, probably where the stamps were just you know moving across the screen as as um, single entities. Yeah, I think that's the other one that uh, that I'm aware of from Joanna. Um, yeah, that's uh, that's you know I just loved that film. No, that's, thank that's, you. That's so beautiful and so fun. Um, um, I wanted to, I mean, I'm kind of jumping all over the place here. So, you know, this, this may end up a little bit disjointed, but since we're, since we're now talking about your short films, um, I will, we can come back to uh, Blood of the Family Tree if we need to, but I just wanted to, just wanted to note and then ask you, um, you know, Certainly in the ones that I saw in preparation for this, uh, rituals and for lack of a better term, ancientness are kind of recurring themes in the films and in Family Tree as well. And I'm wondering, are these, you know, are, are these consciously part of your, um, uh, part of your worldview when it comes to filmmaking? A little bit, part of, um, well, actually, probably a lot. Um, one of the things that's interested me a long time is why with a piece of art could I go to a museum and see a piece from Egypt and it would speak to me? It's like, how is it that art or visual images can communicate across thousands of years and across borders? And a lot of that has to do with the body that we haven't change in that many senses our lives are very very different from people a thousand years ago but in other ways it's exactly the same i mean women give birth it hurts people have sex people hurt their knees they eat you know etc cetera, etc cetera. and and the gestures are also the same and certain gestures are larger than humans like the great apes have gestures similar and so it's through, it was thinking about those kinds of things the, and this connection across um, cultures and time, especially across, across time, that is really interesting to me. And, and through that, I started studying gesture and it's a very interesting field, especially for animators. But um, so I was interested, how can you communicate how can we communicate and how can we communicate deeply and viscerally to each other? And how, how does that work? So that's part of what I've been working on for like a long, long time. And, and so that can, and then I love, you know, it connects me to the art of the past and in Blood of the Family Tree, the, there's the ancestors who are the shadow people. Um, and then there's the grandmothers when they were young. So the, the, char the characters kind of stay with me. And then I, you know, I have a, I mean, all art, medieval art, I'm interested in all kinds. I, I love so many different kinds of art, but both, you know, of course, art brute and folk art and art, you know, and then classical art and contemporary art. And then animation is just, knocks me out all different kinds of animations and I taught our history class for a long time partly because when I started there there were very very few books on animation um, most of them were about Disney or Fleischer Studios you know John Hallis had a few books that where he was starting to do primary research and cataloging who was doing what and then Gian Alberti did his book, Cartoons, which was like a treasure. I got that, at, I think I bought it at Rochman. I lugged it around with me when I was traveling because I just thought, I can't let it out of my sight. It was such a treasure. Right, and, right. and a tone. Um, yes. <laughs> and so a lot of the animators from our generation ended up 
having to study, if you want, if we wanted to know what our history was, we had to figure it out ourselves. And, and so I started teaching the history class, but my great joy in teaching that class was sharing these works that I love, like all the way from Emil Cole and, and Windsor McKay all the way th you know, through and, and sharing them with another new generation was just such a delight. And, and, and ha having students go, oh my goodness, we didn't know we could do that with animation. <laughs> It was just really exciting. I love teaching that class. But now I'm re I retired this year, so I passed it on. Right. I I I I thought I had read that you had retired. So uh, welcome to the club. It, yes. Uh, I can I can tell you it's grand fun. Yes. Um. Uh, you know, let's let's stay in this in this area right now. Uh, you know, you talked about movement and gesture. Mm -hmm. And it is something, uh, it is something that has struck me about your work. I mean, the first film I saw of yours was The Sum of Them, which, uh, which quite, it actually moved me. Uh, I remember when I saw it. Um, but I, you know, I remember I, I, my instructor at the time was saying it's an experiment, you know, experimental film, experimental filmmaker. And in my mind, I had this preconception of what experimental animation or film was going to be. And I saw the some of them, and now, you know, I see your other works, especially things like Singing Sticks and Marrow, and, you know, movement, like actual character-driven movement mm -hmm. is so integral to your art. It's, it's not, you know, it's not what, people, you know, it's not what our prejudices about experimental animation are. Yeah. It's very character driven. Your I know. I, uh, I'm a character animation nerd. It's like nothing is more delightful than to sit with Tom Cito and just totally nerd <laughs> character animation. But, but this, this comes to this idea about experimental being a genre and it's not, it's a method. So I consider like Walt Disney to be an experimental animator because he was trying new things. He stretched the boundaries. He it was risky because if it's, if something's an experiment, you don't know what you're going to get. You're saying like Norm McLaren, what if I do this and this, what will I get? You don't know. So it's a risk. And um, so, so I think that experimental animation is a method, which is that it's an experiment. You set up parameters, you go, what if I do this and this and this, what will happen? Or if I put these two things together, what will happen? Or if I, and that's why playing with materials is also important. It's not a genre and I, you know, I think people start thinking of it as a genre, which is reductive, but it's not abstract animation or non-narrative animation, or, you know, there's a set of, things that people trying to force experimental into a genre and it's not it's, it's a way of approaching the work of generating the work so experimental can be narrative it can be character it can be abstraction it can be installation work it, be, it can be projected on buildings you know these things that stretch stretch animation yeah, I think these are, you know, I think these are really important things for uh, especially young artists to understand and appreciate because it is absolutely the truth. Um, you know, you go to a film festival and I can see it in the crowds, especially when they're student crowds. I can, I can see the physical, the, you know, the physical reactions when the first few seconds of, a, of an experimental film comes mm -hmm. up, there's a slump. <laughs> There's a physical yeah. slump because they have this expectation of, you know, you said Jewel said five minutes, but often, you know, there'll be eight, 10, 12 minutes. Um, and I love your definition of, you know, it's, it's, yeah, it is, it is a way of thinking about what it is you want to create. And if it's an experiment for you and an experiment that you haven't seen or a combination of things that you haven't seen before, it is experimental. I absolutely love that. And we need to talk about this more, you know, we need, yeah. 
we do we need to pull it back yeah so it's not in because it's turn it's kind of a almost like you say experimental and it becomes kind of like it's like a ghetto or lots of preconceived ideas and that's because the term's been used incorrectly and it's setting and it's risky because you can fail there's a real possibility like Toy Story was an experimental film because that was they took they took a lot of experiments to figure out how to do that. Toy Story, you know, no one thought it was, you know, no one thought you could do that with CG, make a whole feature film. They just thought, man, same thing with Disney and Snow White. Like, oh, animation can't be a feature film. Of course, if they remembered that Lottie Reininger and Christiani <laughs> had done it earlier, they would have known that, yeah, you can make it experimental right. or animated feature those were experiments and they are, were experiment and disney's experimentation all through the studio was always towards realism so now realism isn't considered experimental but it could be and abstraction is considered experimental but not necessarily not if it's not breaking new ground and abstract film abstract Animation's been around since the late 19th century. It's nothing new. I mean, the bottom of the phenakistoscopes and some praxinoscopes right. were abstract. Right, right. And the direct, you know, direct to film technique has been around as long as there has been cellulite. Absolutely, uh, yeah. 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 Which, you know, which still gets stuck into the experimental category, but you know, oftentimes can be very narrative driven so I know. Then, you know what does the program you know why does the program like rose bonds <laughs> early early painted on films and some of the exactly stuff. it's like yeah no it, it's it's so that term needs to be redefined because it opens all kinds of possibilities for students you know it's you have to as a faculty you have to deal with their pitches differently but um because they're not necessarily going to work with storyboards. Like I never use storyboards. It's it's like putting a puzzle together to figure out where I'm going to be. But that's just how I work. Right, right. Well, you know, I I um I was next door studio next door neighbors with Ishu Patel for years at the NFB, and mm -hmm. the issue was similar. He had he had key ideas mm -hmm. to kind of guide where he wanted to go uh, but then it was yeah it was how this how the animation was developing how the story was developing in his mind and as he looked at the assemblies and yeah it was it was as fluid as animation could be i mean obviously we don't want animation the production of animation to be completely fluid because <laughs> go crazy but uh yeah but, but allowing yourself to be open to those right. detours and, and those new thoughts. Yeah, absolutely. We need to we need to get this this notion back out into the world, especially with younger filmmakers. Which means, Christine, that you can't actually retire. You need to go back. <laughs> you, you I'll, need to get. Now have more get. time to put my two cents in. <laughs> All right, and unencumbered by uh, by being faculty. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Okay. I get that. I definitely. Get that. <laughs> Um, so you've answered all of that, yeah. Um, oh, I did, this is not a question, this is a comment, but we can talk about it. Um, you know, the, another thing that I, that I recognize and that I love about your films is you have 11 year films with humor mm -hmm. and, you know, in, part of it is part of the joy in discovering that is again, it plays against my preconceptions of you know what I was referring to you know what I was thinking of as genre, but you know it's it, humor is just so human, and you talked about you talked earlier about you know crossing crossing time uh, with art. I think humor does that as well because you know I think it's within us. It you is to, laugh, yeah. to need to laugh all the time, and I just love that. So, you know, is obviously these are 
humor is a key element, but do you, does it come naturally to you in your filmmaking storytelling, or do you really have to think about it? I think so, and it's also, you know, animation's hard, especially when you're doing it by yourself, so I have to amuse myself, and that's probably how I do it, and, and I put myself through school doing, um, like I was an assistant for Ed Love, who in Ed Love was one of the animators for all the Tex Avery stuff. But I was assistant for Ed Love and Layer was doing layout and for Hanna-Barbera and filmation, things like that. And um, I noticed like animators are really funny because there, uh, when I was doing layout, we would stick little things in the backgrounds <laughs> just to, which we, you wouldn't notice if it's, because it's going by so fast, but there was a lot of stuff in all those cartoons in the 80s. <laughs> yeah, the stuff in the background, uh, but it was amusing. I, so. I bet. Tom Cito, uh, you mentioned Tom, Tom Cito recently posted something on his Facebook about um, the Disney film, the, the Frog and the Princess, is, is that what it was called? And, and in one of the panning backgrounds, or like one frame or two frames, there was a nudie photo of <laughs> something that, you know, passed everybody um, uh, until the uh, until the DVD release, when suddenly, of course, everybody could stop the DVD right on the frame. Right, then it's not and, as fun, it's because you can't yeah. hide it the same way. <laughs> and it doesn't get past the checkers then either. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, animator. A weird bunch. They are. They are introverted. <laughs> yeah, extroverted at the same time. Yeah. yeah. Um. Okay. Uh. Well, since we're here and talking about experimentation, I wanted to just talk a little bit about um, uh, the Center for Visual Mu Visual Music, which you are a, a key member. Well, not, I would. I was only really on the board for a short while. Okay. So I haven't really been involved with them too often. I've been working more with glass. Okay. All right. But, then but both of, that. both of those IOTA and, and Center for Visual Music, which were are based on Bill Moritz's archive, are doing mm -hmm. essential work to keep. Um, that genre of visual music, which is different from music videos, right. but to keep yeah. that genre alive and active. So they, so I, I just have to applaud, applaud them. Well, I was aware of IOTA uh, before this, but I wasn't, uh, I wasn't aware of the Center for Visual Music. So, um, but yeah, I agree completely. I remember uh, the first time I, I stumbled over IOTA, I was just blown away. Uh, by what they were doing. It was the first time I discovered Moritz um, and his writing as well. So uh, great, yeah. I mean, for history, Bill was my mentor. I mean, I, I never took classes from Bill, but Bill, I got Bill up to Cal Arts, And so we could hang out and he taught me. I learned so much from Bill and he was extremely generous. And then later on when he was sick, I hired him at, when I was at USC when I was chair to come teach the history class with me. We just had a great time. Oh, and that's lovely. He just did so, you know, let's just take a moment to remember Bill and, and his great contribution to animation history. And, and like us, Bill loved all kinds of animation, just not, not just his, he loved best was the visual, the abstractions and visual music, but he loved all of it. Yeah, yeah, we need to remember those, uh, those pioneers, uh, mm -hmm. definitely. Um, like Jules as well. Wow, they've, they've kind of passed through your, your, your professional life, eh, Bill and Jules. There must be, uh, there must be others. You're so lucky to have been down there. <laughs> yes, yeah, taking, taking care of Jules. And tonight he, I end up being his trustee and executor, so. That was interesting. He had a lot of work. He had 13,000 animation drawings. Oh my god. I goodness. know that because I counted all of them. Wow. That's, uh, that's amazing. 
Yeah, I, I didn't I didn't get to the NFB in time to meet McLaren personally, uh, but my good friend Don Don McGolliams was a personal friend. But I you know I don't think Norman had many drawing artifacts because he was using you know he was using more direct techniques and a lot yeah. of celluloid. So I think there are a lot there's you know there are many dozens of cans of celluloid of, of uh, his experiments, but there's, you know, nothing, you know, nothing in that tangible, frameable uh, form of... Uh, yeah, of there are there's a lot. Yeah, yeah, wow. It's a lot of paper. <laughs> um, we kind of skirted, uh, skirted around absolute, absolute Zanishka a little bit. Um, and I'd just like to take a few minutes to talk about that because for, you know, for most folks, and certainly for me, I was just, you know, I was just coming out. I'd been out, I'd been graduated for, for about 10 years by that point, but I was, you know, I just finished my first film. I was finding my feet uh, as a filmmaker. And then this, you know, just hit. And Everybody at certainly at the film board just went gaga over this. You know, it was it was it was like the most brilliant mainstream validation of animation capital A, capital R, capital T for mainstream audiences. So I want I wanna talk to you a bit about that. Um you know how, okay, so who designed the concept and the parameters? So how did you, how did you go and how did you go about um, inviting the artists? Okay, so um, I had a former CalArts student, Deborah Calabresi, and she was working at a company called Troon. And they were working, Troon um, had a relationship with Shiat Day. And Shiat Day yeah. did, was doing the absolute, uh, absolute advertising and so the internet was just really starting to blossom this is in the like 95 or so and they wanted to so absolute you know had a history of supporting artists and art and they wanted to do a series of content-based websites which really hadn't been done yet and so they they did wanted to do three so the first one they did with um, I can't remember his name, who was the editor of Wired Magazine. And it was kind of about bees. And then Deborah suggested to her bosses at Troon, like, we should do one about experimental animation because nobody's seen that. And so um, they said, well, so Absolute came back and said, well, we can't do, we can't do one about animation. That's for kids. We just press all my... <laughs> and so I, I cut a reel together and then we sent that to absolute and absolute came back and said oh, it's art <laughs> of course we'll do this and at that time the venues the sort of little venues where you people would tour with their films were drawing were lacking funding especially in the united states so it was getting really really hard to see the films because everything was still on celluloid and so you know, I thought, well, if we do this and we do it right, then maybe the internet will end up being a place where people can show the, this work. And then I, and I wasn't, I was kind of hesitant to take it, but then I decided if I didn't do this and someone else did it, then I'd complain. So, so I had to take responsibility. So, so then we wanted it to have three sections. Well, that's I a little, if, if, if I could just, that's a little, it's a little bit like you telling everybody you were going to make a feature film. Yeah, so kind of. You, needed, you that, needed that, that pressure. Yeah. And, and my, and Deborah, who's really, <laughs> it's this whole site is Deborah's fault. Okay. So we want three sections, one to have the history. And then I asked Bill to write the history of experimental animation with the proper definition of experimental. But the stuff that nobody really saw and was really hard to get. And so Bill wrote the first history of experimental. I wanted it to have to show work and I wanted it to show work that people hadn't seen. So I started kind of with the abstractionists and they wanted it to be diverse and come from different countries and showing different techniques so that 
the people could see how diverse animation was. It wasn't just 2D stuff you saw on TV for kids. It had this richness and depth and this just amazing possibility to communicate and to, you know, for, and so, so we, so there'd be that section. And the last section was a tool section where the user could make an animated film. And so I said, I said, we have to make it so they have to go frame by frame. The computer's not going to do any interpolation so that people will go work really, really hard and then go, oh, it's only two seconds and see how hard this is. And, um, and then we had it so people could post it, their, their things and share what they'd done. And it was interesting because the president of Absolute made a little piece and then someone wrote to him, you should be an animator. You're really good at this. And he was really tickled. So there was the tool and then the history section and then the animators, I just started contacting people. We had to do kind of a proof concept. So I asked Faith and Jules and Vibeka Sorens and I think Amy Kravitz and Steve, a few people to do a bunch. And then I decided that we would use the bottle motif. Absolute didn't ask me to do that, but I knew they were having these ad campaigns with the bottles, but I knew the animators could do even better than that. But I, but it was also written in the contracts that they could only use these pieces to advertise the website. They could not use them to advertise the product because they weren't paying enough for that. So, so that's what we did. And then when they saw it, they just absolute, absolute and seagrams were blown away. And so we ended up doing two, two sections. So we ended up with 32 pieces in the end. Um, and then the history section, so we could, and then, oh, I, fl I fleshed it out with the map page, which was the page where you come in, you click on it, it would take you to, you know, where you could do the animation and you could read the history or whatever by young animators. So there are people like Koji Yamamura did a map page. And no, really? That, yeah. And, and um, Lorelai Pepe did one and Leia Zaguri wow. did one. Okay. So that was cool. and Young. Back when they were young. Yes. And, uh, and then the, the history turned out really beautifully because Shiat Day, they designed that spiral. Okay. I mean, they, I mean, uh, it was just a really beautiful way to, to design the history section. And then Bill wrote it. We, and we were able to put little gifts in it and everything had to be, they had to get permission for everything. And it was, the permissions were for five years. And that's why um, after five years, it kind of disappeared because the, we didn't have the permission to keep it up for longer. And then of course that was on the internet one by internet two um, and it was all proprietary software. So it was really, it was very expensive for CUMs and Shite day because they had to write the software and these little tiny, they were just this big, these little tiny films that they were the first streaming media on the internet. Very, very first streaming media. And then they were also Deborah Calbrace and her partner Kelly and Warren, who was doing, um, Kelly was working with the large format film society. It was the same thing where they were going, oh, animation can't work as IMAX films. So we were like, okay, that presses our button. <laughs> and so they shot all the absolute films on, because they came in as 35 millimeter. They didn't come okay. in, they, they came in on 35 millimeter. And, um, and then, so the, we had the 35 millimeter originals. And then, so we could take that and transpose that to IMAX and blow it up. And so these little pieces were the tiniest film, tiniest formats at the time was like little itty bitty things that looped, right. which also changed things like Michaela Pavlatova's yeah. piece that hits his head. That worked really well as a loop. Um, and then they were also the largest format at the time. And everything changed. Like Yerzy Kucha's piece was hard to see on the little one, but on the IMAX film was absolutely stunning. That's 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 so great. I mean, of course, it makes perfect sense that you would you would have filmed them on thirty five, because trying to trying to figure out how to how to how to do that 
a digital native at that time would have been no, impossible. No, you couldn't. You couldn't. Yeah. Yeah, they would have been like 120 by 120 or something like that. Yeah, no. Square. Okay. So then, yeah, and, and I love that. I love that story that they were the smallest del animation deliverable at the time and at the same time, the biggest possible um, animation. Yeah, deliverable. and of course, animation could work on IMAX. And then after of that, of course, we it can. At the conferences, like, and I did a little piece. We did a little piece of jewels, and Bear Bell and Neubauer did a piece on IMAX. And so it, um, and then, then the studios went, oh, <laughs> and and then they, you know, it sort of spread from there. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, I'll, I'll be, I'll be transparent here. You know, I was, I was, uh, I had just become a producer. Uh, I was just becoming a producer at the NFB around then, that was in '97. And you know, one of the things that we we wanted to play with was accessibility of animation. Um, and we had seen absolute, absolute Kanushka, and it was like. Yes, this is this is where we need to go. This is you know this is how it's going to be. I mean, we talked about you know the accessibility of high speed, you know, the, of actual internet, you know, certain um, economic you know the economic uh, inequities around that. But you know, it was clearly a path for the future. But you know, I remember we, and this was probably our fatal flaw. We never talked about the origin medium. We never talked about, well, let's just do everything on 35 and then we'll figure out technologically how to deliver it to uh, to a digital platform. We spent two years trying to solve how to create digitally, how to create high quality digitally and then deliver it. Um, and it took us another couple of years uh, you know, by then technology had caught up with us. It took us another couple of years before we were able then to start uh, doing some digital delivery. And it was right around the same time as well. We too started talking to IMAX about doing large format animation, but we were talking to them about um, uh, stereoscopic. Uh, yeah. IMAX. And you know that's where folks like Monroe Ferguson, uh, who has some family history with IMAX, you know, came in and and um, started doing uh, stereoscopic animation for yeah. the big screen. Vivica, you know, Vivica, uh, Sorens, um, Vivica Sorensen's piece, little one, was a stereoscopic piece. Oh, was it? I didn't know yeah. that. Yeah, uh, yeah, it was a stereoscopic piece. He was yeah. she was working with. Um, like VR, virtual reality and stereoscopic and such thing and CG, you know, 3D stuff early on. Okay. Okay. Wow. Yeah. You know, I love that. I, you know, I'll, I'll be honest. I'm a, a little bit pleased that we kind of share this, uh, share this kind of technological experimentation history. A couple of years separated, but just kind of like, okay, you know, clearly there were there were things in the air for certain people yeah. to start thinking about. And I love that. I love this it's just, brand new connection it, that I have with so, you now. Yes, and it's so great because, like, for example, film Dom by Lenitsa and Barovchak, there were two prints in the United States, one at RISD and one at CalArts. And CalArts, it was called Home, because it was translated. So in CalArts library is listed at home. And CalArts, they the print turned red, they wanted to get a new print so they, they threw it in the trash and they but they got so they ordered a new print of home and of course it was the wrong film I thought Bill was gonna he he just hit the ceiling but you couldn't you couldn't see that film it was really really difficult and it was red and now it's like I can just type it in and there it is and it's restored it's in its proper it's black and white instead of red same thing with Rothschild's Renaissance. I, oh, oh, and the hand. I always thought the background of the hand was gold. Right. Because all the prints had faded. Right. So yeah. I thought it restored and it was blue. I was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> just everything. Right. 
yeah it's, so it's just it's, great yeah. it's just wonderful to see these things yeah i have to say you know there is a it, it there's a there's a certain loveliness to being alive right now mm -hmm. and, but but you know being our our age having lived through you know times of scarcity yeah for animation and for film to now be in this moment of plenty and you know where so much is accessible and you know young young folks are able to see almost everything anything and it's our job to kind of point them mm -hmm. to things that they're not naturally going to go towards because they can yeah I know yeah. it's this it's so great but I hope we don't lose the theatrical experience too because that's oh yeah absolutely thing. level of immersion you know and sound and sound immersion but it's great to have the options yeah absolutely um so i'm going to, we're probably running out of time but we you talked about the, the theatrical experience so let's uh let's loop back uh, and talk about features um uh i just i wanted to ask you because it certainly seems to me and maybe it's just the circles that i travel through it seems to me that the past few years has seen a surge of independently produced features, a lot of them solo mm -hmm. features, and some of them even what are being called experimental features. So I think of not just you, but Chris Sullivan and mm -hmm. uh, Joanna Priestley. Um, and, you know, I don't know what's driving the search. Do you have any thoughts on, on why it's it's now there is the surgeon what's making think, it possible yeah i th i think it's again the technology and that you can do like i i made my whole film here in my base in my cave in my studio and all i need and i had everything i needed and it didn't cost me anything except time and so that's a possibility that didn't exist before um and and the technology has gotten easier and easier to use. Um, so once you get like with the the learning curve on After Effects, it's fairly steep, but it's not as steep as it used to be. And so I th I just think the availability and the possibility that you can do this completely on your own in your basement or you know you don't even need a garage. You just need a corner of your bedroom or something. You can make a feature animated film and so I, I think there's there's that and 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 that allows um, people to build complexity and then I think it's also in the air like once someone a few people have done it other people go like me seeing Lewis doing his piece it's like oh you can do that and and so that is kind of like an avalanche just takes one little tiny rock to start an avalanche. Right, right, yeah. I ju I'm just, I'm desperately waiting though for the dissemination avalanche, right? I, I want access to cinemas to become more available for this kind of work and not just, you know, the highly curated, highly programmed festivals. Circuit. Yeah, you know, it's, it's got to be a way. I, I think when you make these, you have, like for me, I had to go into it not with low with low expectations. Like I figure with my films, I my expectations are low because they're quirky, and um, not everyone. But, but animators are quirky. <laughs> they should be in love with your films. Oh, I yes, I love making them. And then, but you, but I have low expectations of. So when they do get shown, like Blood of the Family Tree is shown in Ottawa, it's like, wow, because <laughs> I, I expect I'm going to make it, I'm going to put it out there and I hope it finds its audience. And, and in my experience, these films do find their audiences. You know, they, they eventually, like Singing Sticks is a good example of finding an audience I never, ever expected because it, it wasn't doing well in festivals and then Melbourne took it. And they took it in the children's section 
And I went, I can what? see that. Yeah. yeah. No, no, I can see that. Yeah. And then it went all around like Australia, New Zealand is like best of children's film. And then even like a few years ago, I got an email saying, can we show Singing Sticks in this best of children's films tape we're putting together for dental dentist offices? And I was like, okay. So it has its life, but it's not one I would have ever, ever in my wildest dreams expected. So it's like, once you put them out there, it's like, but they do find their audiences. Just, but it's just slower than um, a film that's designed for a wider audience. Because they're, like my films are designed for the, they're, just, they're for the people who are gonna connect to them. Because we were talking about personal, Thing. So I have this theory that if you go deep enough into the personal, then you hit we hit the universal. Right. And it's on that level that people connect to the films. And one of the things I do with my films is that, you know, I get to a point where it's sort of coming together. I'll test them on someone who is has nothing, someone who I respect and is a friend or an acquaintance that has nothing to do with the art world or films, just to see how they react to it. And if they, if it resonates in some way with them, then I know I'm on the right track. So, so that's what I, that's one of the ways I can make sure I'm not going off in the weeds is, is and um, that they have the possible, that they're, they're connecting with people and not just people who know what I'm doing. Right, right. And, and absolutely that's, that's the brave thing to do is, you know, share it with, share it with folks who have no connection, no vested interest. And, you know, honestly, it, it just needs one. It needs one person for the film to resonate with and they will talk about it. And then mm -hmm. it begins to multiply. And uh, yeah, absolutely, audiences. Yeah. We, we sometimes, as creators, we sometimes forget about that, don't we? Yeah, yeah, because it's, you know, it's. Blood of the Family Tree, well, my, my niece showed it and she's doing her residency in New York and she related to it on a whole different level about, because she's working with women's health and she's going to be a gynecologist, I think. And so she related to it in a whole different way. And, uh, and so it fires her up to change, change the system for women. Oh, excellent. I love that idea. I love that it, it, it could become an activist film. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's great. Um, is there anything that, uh, that you wanted to talk about that, uh, that perhaps, uh, that not perhaps, but it, that I've missed? Well, we got the, the important things like talking about experiment, the term experimental, <laughs> which is, but no, it's been a delight. I just, you it, know, I hope, I hope, um, well, I know they're going to, that this way of working with films continues and that the form continues to expand, especially now because animation is the core language of digital media and every field is using it. And so the, and, and, oh, and also I think I have another theory, which is animation is the large umbrella and cinema or live action is under this umbrella of animation as well, and it solves the problem like with optical, you know, they all are, are optical printer films, are they animation or not? Oh, that was the other, okay, you know, I was forgetting, I remember who else I have in my list of experimental animation feature films is Pat O'Neill's films of Water and Power okay. and Where the Chocolate Mountains are beautiful films. Oh, okay, and great. composite yeah. films, but, and there's drawings and things in them, but they're animation and, and live action. You know, that could just, and it's how you deal with the shots, whether you work with frames or groups of frames is the difference. And, you know, and anima animation is bigger than cinema, right? Because we have flip books and tropes and all these animation toys. So I think it's, you know, slowly that definition will change and history will look back and think of live action, especially now that most live action films are working with each frame individually, they are animated films, even though still animation is considered um, less than live action. You know, you get people who make an animated film, and you say, well, you're an animation director, and they'll say, you know, it's all animation. They'll go, no, I'm not. 
I'm making, I'm working with actors. It's like working with actors. That doesn't make it not an amateur <laughs> at all, especially when everything is composited. Exactly. Working with actors just makes you a daycare supervisor. That's right. <laughs> yes. so, <laughs> so I think all this is going to, I think it's all in flux right now. But animation is really, really important. And the other thing that really gives me hope is like at the SAS conference, there's all, you know, 20 years ago, you, there was just a handful of scholars looking at animation in any form. And now there's a whole bunch of young people coming in that are studying animation. They're coming in through critical studies or, and they're getting their PhDs and they're bringing kind of le a level of um, a weight to animation studies that wasn't there before. And so that's really hopeful because, you know, it was just completely ignored for so long. And even ignored art historians are trying to write about it. Yeah, yeah. You I'm, have to I'm learn totally about it. <laughs> totally with you there. Yeah, it's it 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 uh, it surprises me so that uh, that there can be an entire conference uh, dedicated to animation academics, folks who you know not necessarily practitioners, but who think of it animation and write about mm -hmm. animation. Uh, you know, as you say, 20 years ago, this was inconceivable. Uh, to me, I would have laughed out loud. Yeah, no, it's, it's like, it's finally starting to be taken seriously. And it needs to be because it's, I mean, schools that don't have an animation studies, haven't hired some, you know, critical studies, or film media that doesn't have a person who can talk about animation has a huge gap in their curriculum because animation again it's the core language of, of the digital age the core visual language right well thank you for this it's been my, a pleasure michael this has been a delight really um so uh hopefully we've inspired uh festival attendees to open their minds and um uh, you know, I'm sure many of them will now start Googling Christine Panushka, and, and uh, <laughs> I encourage them to. Um, so, yeah, thank you again for being here. Thank you, uh, Keith and the whole uh, Spark team for having us, for inviting me to have this conversation. It has been great. And, um, uh, yeah, so folks at the festival, um, enjoy the films uh, enjoy the camaraderie because i know part of it is going to be on site and um yeah watch lots and lots of animation and and i need All to thank i need to thank you michael and keith and the animation festival and thank you for having me it's been sheer delight <laughs> bye bye everybody bye <laughs>